My name is Paul Shelley and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a series where I talk about all things sci-fi and space lore. Today I'm going to be doing another list video, but with a bit of a twist. I will be following up on my first system survey, where I talk about the lore of individual systems from lore, with a list of the first few systems we are likely to get in Star Citizen. Some of this will be obvious, as we know the first three systems already, but the rest are very much up in the air. So I'll be telling you the lore and my reasoning behind why those systems are going to be added into the game first. But before all that, I want to thank you all for watching these videos. The last videos have absolutely exploded in views and caused some great growth on the channel. So if this is the second time you've enjoyed one of my videos, think about subscribing yourself. And if you're like me and absolutely need to know lore exactly when it comes out, then ring the bell. If you've already done that, then hitting the like button on this video will help spread the word. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the first five systems of Star Citizen. The first system is one we already know and love, Stanton. Stanton was officially discovered in 2851 by a nav jumper by the name of Tashi Aaron. When the UEE explored the system, they found it to be an almost perfect system for their kind of settlement four planets in the green zone, three terrestrial super-Earths, one low-mass gas giant with a breathable atmosphere, and a dozen moons. To make it even better, the system had a direct large jump point to Terra, one of the most valuable trade hubs of the Empire. There was a catch, though, as the system was already settled by outlaws and those wishing to live apart from the UEE. This forced the UEE to declare eminent domain, as they have done many times in the past. However, that doesn't seem to involve complicated legal battles in the universe of Star Citizen, unless the might of a UEE battle fleet is your idea of a court case. Unfortunately for the UEE, the discovery of the system came at a terrible time, with the Empire still recovering from the economic turmoil of the fall of the Mezzers 50 years before. There was not a lot of incentive or drive for people to settle new worlds, but the system was far too lucrative to give up. So, the government seemed to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. But they tried to salvage this situation by building what would become the floating city of Orison as a military headquarters to monitor the system, in hopes that the naturally breathable gas giant could become a military dry dock. However, even that wasn't enough, as the system quickly became a money pit, especially after the commander of the system, Admiral Pavlina Marlin, proved far too reckless with her ships and managed to crash an Aegis Javelin, the UES Flysa, in an operation to stop some illegal mining, killing the entire crew and destroying the ship. It was lucky for them that Art Corp was looking to consolidate and expand their production of fusion drives, a process often too dangerous for most settled systems. Knowing the situation, they approached the UEE with an offer for one of the continents on the third planet in the system. This gave the government an idea. They countered by offering the entire planet to the company, and soon found three other companies to sell the rest of the planets in the system to. In return, the UEE made the company's promise to maintain law and order of the system independently of them, to reduce government spending in Stanton. Today, the system holds the record for the fastest development in human history, with Stanton III, now known as R Corp, managing to create a planet-spanning city through a process of subletting development of the planet to hundreds if not thousands of different companies like Redwind and Gemini Weapons. The other three planets are owned by Hearst and Dynamics, Crusader Industries, and Microtech, all of which have used their new homes to improve their wealth sufficiently. As a result, the system is known as the commercial capital of the Empire, where you can get just about any product made by humans at a fairly reasonable price. While the emergence of the violent Ninetales gang and frequent invasions by Xenothreat have caused some turmoil, the system is still seen as one of the safer systems of the UEE, and has held many Invictus and IAE celebrations over the last few years, with no sign of that changing. The next system in the game is going to be Pyro. First discovered in 2469, it was found by accident when sensors of a freighter, owned by a corporation called Pyrotechnic Amalgamated, picked up some strange readings while on a trade route and filed a report, which was mostly forgotten about. 46 years later, in 2493, Pyrotechnic was seeking new mining territories, so they began reviewing old scan records and found the original report from years before. They dispatched an explorer to the region, only to formally discover Pyro and chart its environs. 
This survey noted the overall disarray of the planetary system, the difficulty of finding transportable goods, and the unlikelihood of successfully terraforming anything there. Pyro is a system hostile to just about everything. Its star is undergoing a prolonged nova phase and sends out harmful radiation, which is so strong it can damage ships traveling through. It has six planets, five of which are terrestrial and difficult to terraform, let alone live on, and one depressing green and yellow gas giant which proves difficult to tap for hydrogen. In fact, the system is so chaotic that Pyro 4 is slowly being dragged into the gas giant of Pyro 5. Undeterred, Pyrotechnics set about trying to tame the wild system by building a station in orbit of the sixth planet from the star, the best candidate for long-term habitation, and the easiest to extract resources. While the company built the station, they quickly went to work seeding the planets with what life they could and extracted resources from mines in Pyro 2. However, it didn't take long for the entire operation to bankrupt the company, leaving the mostly complete station as the only truly large-scale habitable location in the system. Since then, the system has been overrun by outlaws, rebels, and pirates, quickly becoming a place of routine gang violence and raids. Today, the biggest player and ruler of the old station, today known as Ruin Station, remains the politically motivated, violent, anti-alien gang known as Xenothreat. However, they aren't the only powers at play. Gangs like the Persistent Headhunters, the cult-like Fire Rats, and the Vigilant Overlords also vie for power in this hostile system. Overall, the system is dangerous, lawless, and hard to live in, but still manages to entice people to try their luck. Out of desperation, stupidity, or a lust for death. After Pyro, the next system in game will be the Nyx system. Discovered at the height of the UEE's territorial expansion, just after the First of Aran War, in 2582, by the nab jumper Carla Larry, the system is mostly unremarkable, especially since it sits at the edge of a dark nebula, which shrouds the entire system. This makes it difficult to scan and navigate and the lack of valuable resources made this system a dud since it was first discovered, sporting only three terrestrial worlds, which are all very hostile to life. Its only value lay in the Glacium Ring, a dense asteroid belt which rings the entire system. A mining company built a small base inside the largest of these asteroids, now known as Delamar, but once the easier minerals were extracted, even they abandoned the system. It was then that a group of anti-UEE radicals took over the base in 2618, seeing the nebula and thick asteroids as the perfect means to conceal themselves from the Mezers, who ruled the UEE at the time. They renamed the base Levski, after 19th century Bulgarian freedom fighter Vasily Levski, who died trying to revolt against the Ottoman Empire. Though the Mezers have fallen, the radicals of Levski remain. Still dedicated to overthrow the government, they still see as corrupt and evil. However, they also know their best defense remains their natural camouflage, and by keeping more violent criminals out of the system, they feel they can remain hidden. Those are the systems we know for sure are coming next in Star Citizen. So note that the last two are my best guesses based on what these systems bring to Star Citizen and their difficulty of production. The next system is likely going to be Castra. I already did a system overview of this system in my first system survey video. How many times can I say system in a sentence? <laughs> Which you can check out in the top right. However, I will give you a quick breakdown of what the system is and why I believe it will be the next system after Nyx. Discovered in 2544, in the middle of the Devaran War, this system has always been tied to humanity's relationship with the Xi'an, as it lies close to the border with the Xi'an Empire. While it is generally an unimpressive system with only two planets, its location made it essential to the military who turned the second planet in the system into a fortress, building the main base on top of the tallest mountain on the planet, Mount Ulysses, and naming it Sherman after the 19th century US Army general. It was an impressive feat of engineering. Built above the cloud layer, it earned the name Island in the Sky, and was the backbone of the UEE military strategy against a possible future Xi'an invasion. As such, the planet was given a rather bland and poignant name of Castra Command, shortened by most to just CASCOM, a name it retains to this very day. Not only was the planet heavily fortified and armed, its orbital station was home to squadrons of bombers and other large fleets, which would use the first planet of the system as target practice, thus earning it the name Bullseye. 
However, as the Cold War with the Xi'an thawed, the military presence in Castra began to disappear, and more civilians called the planet home. As the UEE and Xi'an opened trade relations, Castra became a thriving waypoint for traders heading to and from the two empires, allowing for even more growth. And this even convinced the famed parts manufacturer Kruger to make it their new headquarters. My reason for putting Castra on this list is simple. It's small, and it represents a style of structure we won't have had in any of the other systems. A military system. It's said that much of the original structures of the base remain, meaning there is the possibility for the planetary team to create new styles, which we will see in other locations of the verse, in a smaller, more compact scale to experiment with. Its connection to both Pyro and Nyx also creates an interesting dynamic, giving it two active jump points for the developers to test all wrapped up into one easy planetary package. Now, last on this list is a little different, because we know for sure it's in production, we just don't know when it will land, the Odin system. Discovered in 2532, Odin was one of the first systems humanity discovered during our initial exploration push beyond the solar system. While there was no real candidates for terraformation, the planets were rich with various resources ripe for industrial exploitation. The first planet in the system is a unique one, as it doesn't exist anymore. Known today as the Coil, this former planet is now a dense cluster of asteroids, rich in minerals, but also home to dangerous electric storms, which give outlaws and pirates easy cover. All that remains of Odin 1 is its solitary moon, Gany, which still drifts near the remains of its former planetary partner. Odin 2 is a mostly uninhabitable world with one moon, and houses various weapons testing facilities where hazardous and dangerous tests are conducted, along with the occasional Arctic military training group, who uses the small bases as training facilities for hazardous environment training. Odin 3 holds evidence of ancient life in its rocks, which is quickly being eroded as company uses the planet to test massive scale weapons on the surface, including a test which was recorded by civilians in the area of a massive glowing delta-shaped blast impact cutting directly into the surface of the world. The last planet of the system is a gas giant and home to a UEE-owned automated refueling depot and mining operation, which has caused the cost of fuel to be artificially low. Over the years, the value of this system has diminished, but there are still companies like Shubin Interstellar who have brought their massive mining structure known as Archon Base to try and extract as much as they can from the coil. However, the slow decay of the system has encouraged slavers and gangs to set up shop in the system, the latest being the notorious OMC, a former weapons company that has morphed into a violent outlaw gang trying to wrench control of the system from the UEE. It's also the main location for Squadron 42, so we know that it will be added to the game sooner rather than later. However, because it's likely not going to make it into Star Citizen until after Squadron 42 releases, I believe that Castra is still a better bet for the first system after Nyx. So that was the lore of the first systems we are likely to see in Star Citizen. I'd like to thank you for watching. I'd like to thank those on screen now who support me on Patreon to keep this content going. I'm currently trying to raise enough to hire an editor who will help me increase the quality and quantity of videos coming, including a timed exclusive where I cover the entire history of the Star Citizen universe. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy, think about joining my Patreons for as little as $5 a month. For now, let me know if you'd like me to do another one of these videos. What systems do you think will make it after Nyx? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, remember, Exhistoria at Astra.